anything you do in life, understand that someone else has done it before you. And if you're looking for shortcuts, there's just one. For about, you know, I'm 33 right now. For the first 25, 26 years, I was looking for shortcuts for, to success, and I realized there wasn't any. But in the last half a decade, I realized there is one shortcut to success. And that is by learning from someone who's already done it before you. My man, Bashar, thanks for coming on. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, man. And so uh, digital has been such a huge thing that I've had a lot of good friends and buddies of mine come on and talk about. Yes. And it, it's crazy when people don't understand this digital side that it can actually change lives. And so I want to talk about, first, before we get into all the things that you've helped people with, how did you first embrace digital and what was that experience and transition like? Because that is a really, really big mind shift that people have to make before they can even take in the knowledge that we have. Well, it was interesting actually, because I, all my life, I uh, worked in restaurants up until before I went online. Uh, my first job in America in 2006 being a uh, uh, burger flipper at McDonald's, right? And, uh, and so the first, like, uh, the first few, few, uh, years, probably a decade of my life as, uh, putting myself out there and, and working, mm -hmm. it was mainly in restaurants and retail, right? Until, uh, in 2015, April 28, 2015, I got a call 5 PM, um, saying the kitchen is on fire. And I was like, okay, what is that about? Put it out. How bad is it? He's like, no boss, you don't understand. This is John, the bartender. You got to come back because the fire engines are here. We're all outside. The kitchen is on fire. And this was my restaurant that I've had for about two and a half years by now. Um, I had invested all of my family savings in there. I was about 23 years old when I first bought it. Um, so by the time I get there, the kitchen is on fire and uh, everyone's outside, about 12 engines outside. And, um, and what I realized is that I haven't paid my insurance in about four months. So I lose the place. Uh, I lost about half a million dollars that I had invested in the place over the you know the, the previous two and a half years, mm -hmm. and I came out of that uh, with about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt. So a twenty-five year old kid with twenty-five uh, with one hundred fifty k in debt. I met someone about seven eight months prior who I believed was someone that I really wanted to spend the rest of my life with, mm -hmm. in no family savings because they had trusted me with their savings and were like, "You're the ticket to freedom." Yeah, and um, and I realized that I'm screwed. But I had two options at that point, either be the victim and say, why me? Or say, okay, well, what's the lesson learned here? Let me do something different. If that's when I met a friend from high school that told me he was, you know, working, working from home. And I was like, working from home? What does that even mean? Well, what is that all about? You know, um, went on to YouTube, started researching and, uh, and uh, you know, came across a zillion things where the audience probably sees now when they go online. Mm -hmm. And it was just mind boggled, not at the, the opportunity that was available, but at the, um, the, what's the word that I'm looking for? The, um, the barrier, the low barrier to entry. Because when I first started my restaurant, we invested 200 grand just to buy the place. Yeah. We had to, you know, I had to physically be there. I was limited to the local people in that city, which would, was only about 40, 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the room for growth wasn't there. You know, I can grow it to, you know, maybe a six-figure a year business, but I couldn't go to seven, eight, or whatever else beyond that. I, was, I didn't even know that it even existed, right? Let alone needing employees, needing, like needing all the things that traditional businesses require. So going to online and seeing the fact that not only can I make money from my from my phone, not only can I do it from anywhere in the world, not only the barrier to entry is so low in terms of investment, capital, everything else, to me was very shocking. And I've just been hooked for the last decade. Yeah, you made some great points there. And that's crazy that literally the timing of the fire happening and insurance being paid. I mean, that's that's a blessing and a curse. Sure. Anyway. Yeah. And, but it's the way that you responded first. Yeah, say, I can either be a victim or I can go find a different path or find a different route, which is the first thing is, is the mindset. Yes. But then second is, like you said, it's a low barrier to entry business. Correct. And really it's just a knowledge gap between, you know, the actual cost of the business, because there always is a cost, 100%. but it's not 200 grand to start your own Amazon business. It's not 200 grand to start an agency. It, it, right. Nowhere near that. It's some skill sets, some knowledge, some courses, and that laptop. Yeah. And you can at least start. And so uh, did you, you start in Amazon right away? After learning some skill sets, or did you go into marketing? What was the path that you took there? No, I, I mean, I, uh, I took probably about half a dozen different courses, and that was because I looked when I looked at back at my uh, restaurant journey, um, 
I realized one of the biggest reasons why it had failed, because it wasn't, it, it's not like it was making money when the fire happened. The fire was kind of like one of those things where it was the last thing to cut me out of it and remove me completely, because it just, it was struggling from day one. Mm -hmm. And when I look back, I was a, uh, um, I was a struggling entrepreneur simply because I didn't have the experience to do what I, what I needed to do. Because I realized that there are tens, hundreds of thousands of successful restaurants in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's not the business model, it's me. And I had too big of an ego to ask for help. And that's unfortunate, I've seen a lot of people do is, well, if you've been able to figure it out, I can figure it out on my own. I can do it by myself. And unfortunately, that just leads to bad decisions. I've done it many times and it's always been to lead, uh, you know, led to bad decisions. So I was like, all right, I'm not gonna start anything unless I know exactly what I'm doing. And I can't do that unless I find someone who knows what they're doing and show me how it's done. Mm -hmm. And so I started taking courses. I started uh, doing like uh, real estate wholesaling, uh, training stocks, uh, affiliate marketing, and a few other things until I came across Amazon FBA. And that's when I realized, okay, the opportunity is large. Um, I can do it from anywhere in the world. The barrier to entry is low. And, you know, that's when I got started into it. That's awesome, man. That's a similar story to actually how I kind of got started in online too. I remember I made some money. I bought probably like five or 10 different courses on stocks, e-com, private label, e-com, John nice. Swig. I, I bought so many different courses to try and figure out which game to play. And I stumbled on, on Amazon as well. So were you doing FBA back then or did you do FBM and like drop shipping and arbitrage first? I did arbitrage. So that was kind of then again, even lower barrier to entry. Yeah. You know, I could, yeah, I was the crazy guy, you know, down the, 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 the aisle at TJ Maxx and Home Goods, like scanning products and then seeing how they, you know, and I remember my first sale, you know, waking up in the morning, seeing a forty two ninety nine sale on my phone. Like that was probably the happiest I've, I've felt and that I had felt at that point in years. Uh, because not only, you know, previous to that, I had to buy the food, prep the food, serve the customer, cleaning after them for us to make a $10 sale for a sandwich and a beer. Where here, I didn't touch the product. I didn't talk to the customer. I didn't do anything. And we were able to make a sale, you know? Oh, no. uh, so I was hooked. That's what I know. I was like, all right, I can scale that. But then I was like, you know, driving to different places every day, back in my, my car with a bunch of stuff. And I realized that that wasn't scale, yeah. you know? Um, after about six months is when we stumbled upon private label FBA, which is what we do now. So we go directly to manufacturers, um, we find a product that has, uh, you know, has a demand on Amazon. Mm -hmm. We create our own differentiation of it. We create our own brand. Manufacturers ship directly to Amazon's warehouses where they store the product, fulfill the orders, do customer service. So, you know, we're selling, I don't know, thousands of, tens of thousands of units per month at this point. Mm -hmm. And I have zero Amazon boxes in my house. Well, except the ones that my wife orders every other day. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those definitely stack up for 100%. sure. 100%. For sure. So that's an interesting uh, transition. I think most retail arbitrage people, they go this route because for those that maybe don't know, retail arbitrage, you're buying, let's say, Nike shoes at, well, at Dross or TJ Maxx or Marshalls, and you're selling them on Amazon or whatever platform, and the spread of those two distribution channels is what you're making. So if you bought it for 50 bucks and you sold it for 100, after all the fees, you make maybe like 30 bucks from doing that. And so doing that over and over and over, you kind of have that inventory in your car, in your garage, and it kind of stacks up if you're trying to scale that. And so the problem is, like you said, is that's a lot of labor of finding and sourcing your products by going to every Marshalls or going to every Kohl's or whatever yeah. to get those products just to put them online and then switching to a different model where the demand is there and the money is made on the purchasing of products and the bulk of products. Correct. And that's where that's where we play as well now for my companies, but it's such a more lucrative model in my opinion because you make money on the buy just like if you get a, a you know, the way i compare it it's like if you get a share of a stock super early on you know it's an ipo like you already know that there's going to be some upside and some margin intact it may fluctuate but you know that that product is going to sell based off of if you choose the right product so that's kind of the model overall just for those that are maybe are e-com savvy and don't know what's going on but let's talk about that FBA and private label model, when should people jump into that in your opinion? Because you came from the lowest barrier to entry side and so did I of e -com. When should someone make the jump in your opinion? Well, unfortunately, some people never make the jump. And that's the thing. It's like, if you do start with the arbitrage and, and all that stuff, you do want to make the jump because as you said, it, it's not it's not easily scalable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend if you, if you have a capital, I would recommend you go directly into private label. 
uh, because the, especially if you are, you know, if you're someone who, you know, you, you've got a job, you're doing well, maybe you're into the six figures and you're like, or maybe you have a business that's doing well and you want second income stream. It's a lot of ins and outs. Like I was riding for Uber. So I had a lot of time and put my hand, you know, and I couldn't drive around a sudden. Sometimes in between rounds, I'll just shut off my Uber app and I'll go drive to TJ Maxx and I'll scan a few things for an hour and then I would, you know, get back on the, on the road. Mm -hmm. But I had time on my hands, you know. Uh, but for someone that's busy or got a job or whatever, it wouldn't make sense. If you've got the capital, I would say once you have at least ten to $20,000, it probably makes sense to, you know, make your way into private label, start your store, launch your first product, and specifically on Amazon I'm, I'm, I'm uh, referring to. And then from there, you want to continue scaling it, right? If you have a few hundred dollars, if you've got a thousand dollars and that's all you've got, you can start with arbitrage. Although... I was $150,000 a debt when I got started on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of people look at their bank account and try to start a business on a budget. And I think that's the worst mistake anyone can do because you are robbing yourself of a massive opportunity. You know, when you look at, I was just, I don't know why Donald Trump came on my, on my, on my feet today. Okay. <laughs> and he got slapped by an $88 million lawsuit or whatever today. Love him or hate him. That's not the point. If you look at his, his, his net worth is two and a half billion dollars, but he's only got about $400 million in the bank. Where's the rest? And how did he get to where he was? Well, um, he borrowed money. He probably is, you know, a billion dollars, over a billion dollars in debt right now from banks. He borrows money from the bank and then he goes and starts his, uh, uh, what's it called? You know, his businesses and his hotels and all that. Well, that's the thing, the same thing with me. Instead of just saying I've got 150K in debt that I have to clear first before I can start saving money to go start my Amazon business. Mm -hmm. What I did was I borrowed money, right? And then I started with that money as a an investment to start my business. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of OPM, yeah, other people's money, which and the fortune with a lot of parents raised us to never borrow money, never partner up with people. I think that's why it's a, kind of a, a evil thing to do, you know? Yeah, I mean, especially if the business model is wrong and it goes south, correct, like a restaurant, for example, or something that's just heavy and has a lot of weight and overhead. I mean, you're running on fun margins, so that scarcity and that uh, feeling of just like, hey, you shouldn't borrow money, just keep what we have here because we have to protect this. It's it's a mindset. It has nothing to do with the capital. Correct. It has nothing to do with the money. It has nothing to do with the entrepreneur who gave you the capital. Yes. Because those beliefs and that energy, that transfer them, a firm believer that that money, you also inherit the beliefs of customers. So that's yeah. why like denying certain clients is probably better for you. So you don't have all that energy coming in. And so what does it actually take uh, to run an Amazon business? Because there's a lot of people that are trying to see if that's the right thing for them, if it's something that they should even do. And there's a lot of flash out there when it comes to Amazon screenshots and online gurus. So yeah. let's kind of break down what, what are the key important parts of an Amazon business and in your case, private label. So the first thing is you got to have capital, right? Um, and if you don't have the capital right now, you got to have 10 to 20K. If you don't have it, don't let it be what's going to stop you because it's out there, right? I was 150K in debt. You were in debt. We made it happen. There's a thing called OPM. Every single, you know, there's a reason why the, the stock market exists, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the stock is available because you invest in it. They take your money, they grow their companies, and then they give a return. Well, why can't you do the same thing for your own self, right? For your own business. Hmm. We borrow money to buy houses. We borrow money to go get a, a fifty year, uh, a fifty thousand dollar year uh, degree, you know, <laughs> education or whatever. Why can't we do that for for uh, our businesses? So that's the first thing. The second thing is a solid mindset and an understanding that this is a business just like any other, right? You can't expect to wave a magic wand and you're gonna become a millionaire next month. It mm -hmm. just doesn't work that way. It's a business just like any other. Uh, you're gonna be required to make certain decisions. There's gonna be ups and downs. You need to keep a level head and you need to make sure that you are running this again, just like any other business. Mm -hmm. The third thing is obviously being able to understand how to negotiate certain deals because you're gonna be working with suppliers that you know wanna see that you're really serious about business. And that's why, you know, I love the whole side hustle um, society and the whole side hustle thing. But at the other point, what I've realized over the years is you can't really do anything great or you can't really be great at anything unless you are focused, mm -hmm. right? 
that's why focus is one of my personal core values and the one of the top core values for our company. It's because you all, each one of us has a limited amount of time, energy, resources, all that stuff. And the more you put it and focus it on multiple things, the less of it you're going to have focused on every single thing. And when, you know, people say, well, Elon Musk has seven multi-billion dollar companies. I'm like, sure, today. Look at Elon Musk when he first started. Mm -hmm. He started with one company. He sold it, invested in three, those grew, and he started investing in others. No, no entrepreneur has gone to where they are with doing seven things at the same time. They focused on one thing and then grew it beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so those are, I would say those are probably the main important things. And then the last thing I would say is finding the right product, especially for uh, being a, a private label seller. Um, there are 12 million products on Amazon. 500 million customers shop on Amazon every single year, spending between $1,200 to $1,500 so there's demand. You just got to find the right product, place it or find the right customer, differentiate it correctly. And if you go to your competitor's listings mm -hmm. and look at their reviews, their negative reviews, your, their customers are telling you everything you need to know. You'll take what they're saying, you know, badly or negatively about their products, make your product that much better, launch it to customers. They're out there. Yeah, absolutely. And you made a really good point, especially around treating it like a real business mm -hmm. because suppliers are where you make your money. Yes. They have to give you the product at some sort of wholesale rate or at even at cost if you're doing private label Yes. because that's where the money's made. If you choose the right product, all the money is in the purchase of the inventory. Yes. And when we work with our, you know, our suppliers like PepsiCo or some of the bigger, you know, companies like P&G and stuff, that's why the model that we have and the model that we've built with our warehouse infrastructure, et cetera, is so key because you actually show to the people that you're trying to do business with that it's serious. And you don't need all the warehouses and everything to start, but the mindset is key because it will lead to that at some point if you grow really, really big. Yes. Or it may be you renting out for warehouses, but um, it's still just the mindset about where this can actually scale. And like you said, um, online, people get this weird mindset that it's just automatic. Correct. It's not automatic. It's no. everything behind the scenes. It's like the iceberg and the screenshot of your Amazon store, the screenshot of whatever online business you're doing is just the tip of the iceberg. Yes. So let's talk about from there, the mindset, to have the business, to have the capital is just the next step as simple as going and getting product or how long do you think someone could actually take from saying, hey, I'm starting now. When can I get my first products sold on Amazon? And what should I expect during that period? Anything you do in life, understand that someone else has done it before you. And if you're looking for shortcuts, there's just one. For about, you know, I'm 33 right now. For the first 25, 26 years, I was looking for shortcuts for, to success. And I realized there wasn't any. But in the last half a decade, I realized there's one shortcut to success. And that is by learning from someone who's already done it before you, right? Because I've launched nine businesses. The first seven failed. Number six and seven actually succeeded for a little bit and then failed. All the first seven were done by me observing and then trying to do it by myself. Number eight succeeded and is still successful. Number nine succeeded and is still successful simply because I tapped into someone else's knowledge and I continue to tap into other people's knowledge that are way ahead of me mm. and learning from their mistakes. Because I heard a, a quote by Warren Buffett a few years ago he said, a, a smart man learns from his mistakes, but a wise man learns from other people's mistakes. And I just realized that, you know, many times it's taken me to make the mistake twice for me to learn from it. And I'm like, all right, so I'm not smart, I'm not wise. Okay, what's going on here, you know? But now I make it a point. It's like, I'm trying to do this. Who's the best at this in the world? I don't care what it costs. Let me pay them. Because I know the ROI is there. I've done it in the past. Last year alone, we invested over $600,000 in Courses, masterminds, mentors, coaches, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Just because I know the ROI is massive. So I would say that's the first step. Whatever you're trying to do, Amazon FBA, trying to start a podcast, I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. Find someone who knows what they're doing, invest, okay? Um, that's the first thing. The second thing I would say, yes, it's, it's going to be, you know, really listening to their advice. You know, because I've done it many times and I've seen many people do it. We'll start listening to someone. And then ego gets in the way or some other stuff gets in the way. Yeah. And then we stop listening to them. Yeah. Well, I know how to do it. Okay. Yeah, sure. But, but you know what? I could probably do it better. I can't tell you how many times 
I've paid tens of thousands of dollars, upwards of $25,000 an hour mm -hmm. to sit in front of someone, ask them questions, give me something, go back and not do it because I know how to do it better than them. Mm -hmm. And then six months, 12 months later, I'm like, well, shit, should I just listen to what they said? I paid them. Yeah. Obviously, at some point I thought they know better than me. Why didn't I just listen to them? Yeah, and you know? it's it's something that's really funny because I've I've gone down the same journey. I've spent over half a million in, in courses, consulting, masterminds, etc. And you may not see how that fits in your leverage now, mm -hmm. but like you said, when you're building a business, the growth is coming, the intention is there. That same the the same theory or the same philosophy that they gave you, you will catch up to it because if they're ahead of you you're going to grow into their philosophy. 100%. And the philosophy of what you can deploy through your team, through your leverage, is what makes it valuable, even if it doesn't apply now. Yeah. So I'm a huge believer in studying people that have done it before me, done it in even different industries, because business to a degree has very similar fundamentals. Very and people go through the same alchemy of, hey, our cash flows were tight. What do we do in this situation to fix our marketing? Or what do we do to reduce cost on this side of our business? Like there's all these different nuances to different businesses, but the philosophies roll up. And that's why when you see Bill Gates say something like you just mentioned, or other entrepreneurs say something that's timeless, it's because it sits atop all of the activity and that's a guiding principle. Yes. And I love, you know, reading books. I mean, the library is awesome over here. Yeah. I, I was I, looking I, at some books. I'm like, oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah, man. I love it. I love it just because who am I to, you know, I'm just programmed. I'm a software. The end of the day, we're all software. We get to install the OS by the people that we listen to, the books that we buy, the courses that we have, and really our ego is like trying to hold on to the prior software. Yes. Like obviously that software isn't getting you to where you want to go. Yeah. So how about we just update it? That's all. Update it over well, time. See, it's it's you know what it is. It's uh because our brains are designed. So our brains have a negativity bias, and because they don't like change. Our brains are thousands of years old, millions of years old, depends on what you believe in. And they are designed to keep us safe, to mm. protect us. Because out in the, when we were cavemen, it was out, we were out in the wild, right? And it was about either kill or get killed. So our brains had to be on alert 24 seven. And they had to be always looking out for, you know, is there a tiger coming this way? Is there, you know what I mean? Yeah. But the problem is, because our brains are wired that way, like that's why whenever we see something, we're always pointing out the negative. The first, the first thing we, you know, see a success story, it's like, well, he probably got handed, you know, a half a million dollars. Well, probably got this or probably got that. Yeah. It's not because we're bad people. That's just how our brains are wired. Our brains have a negativity bias. And unless we rewire our brain, our, that negativity bias will take over our, our, our lives right? And we'll always look for the negative. And what you look for, you find. What you focus on grows, right? And so that's why it's really important for anyone listening right now is to rewire your brain and say, how can I see the positive in everything? And how can I, especially as I mentioned earlier, remove my ego from the equation? Because if I am paying someone to listen to their advice and that knows what they're doing, let me just listen to it. Let me actually just do it instead of jumping in the middle and then trying to you know say no i know better i shouldn't do this or i should do this because as an entrepreneur you are going to have obstacles as mm -hmm. an entrepreneur you are going to be faced with you know with a lot of situations where you're not going to be able to you know you're not you're going to not know where to go left or right and your brain is probably going to tell you don't do this don't make this change stay where you are but you have to come in and override that and say no the the Prosperity is on the other line, uh, is on the other side of comfort. Prosperity is on the other side of, of, of change. I must change in order for me to see what's on the other side and experience what's on the other side. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if, you, if you stay where you are, nothing's going to happen. You yeah, know? absolutely. And dude, it, one of the things that you pointed on was the duality of being able to choose what you're being uh, fed and choose what you're listening to while also denying the beliefs that aren't attributing to what you actually want. Yes. So it's actually a double-edged sword where, hey, I want to go learn a new skill set. The best way to actually grow is to first remove things. The fast way to make a Ferrari go faster is to remove stuff from the front. Yes. Like take old programming out, take old beliefs out, replace them with new. And that's why when you hear entrepreneurs and they're just in philosophy world or talking about concepts, it's because these core beliefs have, are guarded. And the Bible says that your mind is like a garden. It's a mental factory that whatever you put in, you're going to produce out as, you know, within the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So these are all 
biblical principles. They're all tried and true. Ancient principles, like it's just in this digital era, there's so much information. And so what would you say to people that, you know, I've heard of the Amazon thing or even just online skills and courses overall, what would you say is probably the best way to vet someone that's not only credible, but that can actually help them get to the next stage that they want to go to? What would you say? So I have this thing that I call the discovery phase. Um, you first want to find out if this thing is the thing that you want to do. And then within that, you'll figure out who you want to listen to. So first, what you want to do is you want to spend at least two to three months. And yes, this, this is a three to six month process because anything great doesn't happen overnight. So you want to spend at least one to two months um, listing, you know, pretty much searching for everything that's out there, right? Um, so, and, and making a short list of five, 10 things that you might be interested in and just simply search for everything. The second step would be come up with the top three things that you feel like, okay, I can actually, I see myself doing these things. So out, after you come up with about five to 10 things, you want to you know, bring down your list about three things. And then the third step would be finding two to three people in each one of those three things and follow these people for two to three months and sit and listen to what they're saying, right? And see which one of these different skills or different people you can resonate with. And then what you want to do is you want to remove everything and you want to pick one person. But before you do that, you want to ask yourself these two questions. Number one, do I see myself doing this one thing for the next one or two years, minimum? Minimum one to two years. It's mm -hmm. not two months, not six months. It's not why, you know, I call them Lambo gurus, tell you on Instagram. It takes long, okay? Uh, do I see myself committing to this one thing for at least one or two years, minimum? If the answer is yes, go to question number two. If after one to two years, this goes nowhere and trust and know that there's a possibility that it might go nowhere. Again, Amazon or not Amazon, it doesn't matter. After one to two years, if this goes nowhere, will I regret having started this thing? If the answer is no, I won't regret it, then you have found the right thing. Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, I will regret having wasted one or two years, then you want to go back to the drawing board. And once you have answered yes to the first question, no to the second question, then you want to find the one person. And then I say focus. And that stands for focus on one course until successful. Mm, and just stick that. to it for the two years. And don't try to listen to this guy and that guy and this other guy to learn the one thing. Not saying that one person is right and the other is wrong, but they all might have their own way to get to the place you're trying to go. And their advice might contradict each other. And that's another mistake I've seen a lot of people make. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, five plus five is 10, eight plus two is 10, right. two times five is 10. Like, yes. so there's all these different formulas and they may not apply to digital or fa Amazon or Facebook ads or whatever, right? Just there's different combinations to reach an outcome. Yes. So I love that. And I love focus, say that one more time. It was focus on- One course until successful. One course until successful. I love that. I mean, I did buy a lot of courses at the <laughs> beginning. Like just like you just had a smorgasbord of them yeah, and yeah. I was kind of confused for a bit. Um, but I also did that with mentors. I focused on one mentor at a time too. Yes. Like you said, once you discover that one to two people that you really, really like and that you want to take advice from, go deep on what they're doing and see how they're moving. Because a lot of times, like you said, Lambo gurus will show you the flash, they'll show you the car, they'll show you how it drives, and that's all the entertainment side. Uh, but the most of the other entrepreneurs that actually are doing things are either providing value or showcasing their lifestyle. Not flashing, saying, hey, I got money, you need to pay me money so I can continue to afford this. It's, you know, there's there's a distinct energy associated to those posts. Showing off a Lambo isn't bad, but it's what's the intent of the person? Why are they doing it? And so, um, you know, the entrepreneurs that I got, you know, introduced to were Grant Cardone and uh, really Tony Robbins. Those are the first two that I just went super deep on. And uh, for me, read their books, courses, masterminds, but I just continued to go down that rabbit hole yep. until the numbers started to change. Like, so focusing on one course or one mentor until successful is awesome because a mentor should be pouring into you. Something in your life should be changing. Yep. If it's a spiritual mentor, great. You should have a close relationship to God, higher power, energy, whatever it is that you are trying to seek, right? Same thing with business. Like the surroundings will change. If your surroundings aren't changed, then maybe you have a bad mentor Correct. and you got to find a new one and that's okay. Maybe you didn't vet it as well as you should have, but that's part of the game. You know, online could be kind of hard to find those people. So uh, when it comes to, you know, choosing your mentors, um, I know you just gave them some great advice and stuff, but who was probably the most impactful mentor that you've had along the way? Um, 
the 18 year old kid uh first the, the first very first mentor was an 18 year old kid can't remember his the guy's name i've looked him up so many times on 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 social media can't find him he's 18 um, he's about 18, age 18 year old kid <laughs> uh you know was uh he used to run around in a tank top and he he did have a lamborghini oh he, he did that that was one of the things that was like kind of like intri- not attracted me pissed me off about him mm. because at that time it was an ego thing so he was an 18-year-old kid, obviously successful. If he can afford a, a Lamborghini, successful. Um, I was 25, and I had real business experience under my belt, mm. unsuccessful. And so my thing was like, if this kid can do it, I can do it. And I went and launched my first pro- three products by myself and failed. And then kind of gave a, an ego a push, bought his course, and uh, and it was was probably the worst course I've ever seen in my life. But it, it literally <laughs> gave me like three things that I was like, oh my god! Each one of those products missed one of these things, and that's why they failed. And bam, you know, and that just exploded from there. And from there, I just kept on investing. But then when I went into um, building my consulting business and building BJK University and scaling that was Sam Ovitz. Mm-hmm. Uh, you yeah. know, since then, I mean, I've I've probably invested nearly three quarters of a million dollars since Sam Ovitz, but Sam Ovens has made the biggest impact into my business. And that's why now I'm, uh, besides the recently Alex Hermosi, I was the largest investor in school. Uh, oh, nice. I, I, you know, I was like, yeah, I've made most of my money because of you. You're trying to build this thing. I'm an investor. We use the product. It's an amazing product. I'm investing in you, not necessarily the platform, but the platform is amazing. Yeah. But that's one person that I, until now, I seek as a boss. So have you met Hermosi yet? Because he's also invested in it. Um, I haven't met him in person. I'm flying over to his uh, thing uh, uh, in two weeks. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Are you going to get the, you already have this mustache. I do have the so mustache. You should get the tank top the tank and just top. show yeah, up with well, him. Well, <laughs> I need a, I need a few pounds here before I, uh, yeah. I do that, you know? Maybe he can help you out. Yeah, I know, right? You'll yeah. give him the mustache tips. He'll give you the, <laughs> the juice or whatever there he's on. Go. I don't know. Yeah. No, he's a great dude. I love Hermosi. And he's actually probably one of the first direct response marketers outside of Russell Brunson that really started to make that marketing lead gen sexy again. Mm -hmm. Because Russell was that entrepreneur that changed my life. Once I understood funnels, I was like, oh, this all makes sense. Yes. That's why this opt-in funnel, that's what happened when I bought this core. Like now I get it. It's the the plan. It's the actions. Um, But like you said, investing in that first mentor makes the biggest difference because that's when you have nothing or you at least have a low level of income. And then when that jumps, you're like, whoa, that big first jump from, you know, 10K to 100K is like awesome. Or if it's zero to 10K, dude, that's even better because you were at zero, right? And the skills will compound. And so that first mentor is key. That first mentor does make the biggest impact. That's why I love asking entrepreneurs. It's like, who was that for you? Because there had to be someone that had that first emotional imprint in you that keeps you going nowadays. And so what is that why that keeps you going after you've made millions of dollars and stuff? It's different for every entrepreneur. Could be legacy, could be family. But I'm curious to hear, um, what is the why for you that continues to keep you pushing and also helping people with the diversity of the uh, the university that you're building? You know, I, I love the question. And and, and uh, I don't know why I didn't say that when you said, what is the first thing that someone should do? Uh, because I almost always say this. And for whatever reason, I didn't. But I'm glad you asked it. It start with why. Um, the one thing that I realized, so Tony Robbins talks about this. There is there is two forces to can, to keep you going in life. There is the push and there is the pull. So the push is you're motivated. You are motivating yourself. You have a core. You have a, a a mentor. You have something in life that happens. Maybe it's a crisis that motivates you. Whatever it is, and you're pushing. You're trying to accomplish something. But then when you get to a certain point where pushing isn't so um, isn't so important anymore because you have made ten thousand dollars a month and you know a year ago making ten thousand dollars a month was like oh my god I can't even dream of that yeah. or going from a, a ten thousand a hundred or a hundred to a million or whatever it is and it's like at this point it's like more money isn't really going to change my life anymore it'll be cool and it's more of a measure of success than anything that's where the pull has to has to happen mm. and the pull really comes from a strong why but most importantly regardless which level you're at having a strong why and starting with a strong why is important and the, it, it, having a strong why is different than passion i remember going online and listening to gary v uh, you were exposed to tony and grant i was exposed to grant and gary 
And so Gary Vee would talk about uh, having your passion, do you know, finding your passion and stuff like that. And I'm like, fuck your passion, dude. Dude, he lost me with the freaking selling garage sales and yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like, yeah, dude, yeah. I, I get it, but that's yeah, a exactly. bit extreme with arbitrage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I when I hear someone talking about their passion, I say this: unless you were born with a paintbrush in your hand, you've got an amazing voice, you picked up a soccer ball or a football when you were like four years old, and you're just great at it, you've got a, an awesome skill and you really enjoy it. Yes, do that and nothing else. But for the average person like myself, I, I, would, I clearly didn't have a, a skill when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And so when I lost my restaurant, I'm, you know, I'm, I just lost half a million dollars. I'm 150K in debt. I ain't got no time to go finding my passion. I am freaking out every day. Mm -hmm. I am waking up to death threats every single morning because my employees who live in the same city are telling me, dude, you haven't paid my last paycheck. Not because I didn't want to. I didn't have money in the bank. And I'm like, dude, I'm driving for Uber. Here's a picture. Give me a couple of weeks and I'll pay you. And I'm freaking out because debt collectors are calling me. The IRS is levying my accounts. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to go find my passion. I was this close to go robbing the bank. You know what I'm saying? It's like, dude, I got to find something. Like, I'm in survival mode right now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, and I may be wrong, but I feel like if you want to find your passion, you've got to come from a place of abundance where I was, I was com coming from a place of scarcity. Mm -hmm. And that's where the push is, right? My why, when I was then, although I didn't realize that until a few years ago, I need to clear my debt. I need to retire my parents and gain the respect of my dad back because he was my, he was my, 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 you know, my idol. And I looked up to him. That's mm -hmm. why I wanted to become an entrepreneur like him. And I wanted to marry the love of my life, who I had just met, you know, a, a few short uh, months prior but I realized that she was the girl. Mm -hmm. And I, every time we'd hang out, I've got 35 bucks in my pocket, you know? And so that's the important thing is if you have a strong why, life is going to throw a bunch of shit at you, but it's going to keep you going. And that's why having a strong why being very clear. And it's like, you can almost see, you can close your eyes and you can sit there and see what winning looks like, right? And you can like envision it in your brain. And you have to like remind yourself. And when when things get tough, you got to remind yourself because things will get tough. Mm -hmm. If you want to start a business, you want to start a new career, you want to move, you want to get married, you want to do whatever it is in life, things will get tough. It's not rainbows and sunshines. And like Rocky Balboa says, you know, <laughs> nothing hits uh, harder than life, but it's not about how hard you hit, but about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done, mm -hmm. right? And so that strong why will keep you going in life. And starting there is the first place anyone, any entrepreneur, any, and even if you want to go get a new job, whatever it is you're trying to do, that's the first place you want to start. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And uh, I know that feeling because I've been in those debt situations where, hey, I ended up in about a hundred grand in debt with one of my businesses that failed as well about maybe four or five years ago. And I felt that same thing, man, where it's like, Hey, I don't, I don't care about my passion right now. Yeah. I'm here to propel forward, change my situation, change my life, change what I'm going through. And when you get that clear, and unfortunately, I mean, we had to end up in debt to figure that out, but I think there has to be some sort of setback to get that clarity. And uh, when, when you have that clarity, there's nothing like it. Like that's why he's saying when the why is defined, nothing else should matter in it becomes tunnel vision and you don't let these small things of a bank account freeze or payment processor shut down or any of these little hiccups that happen in business throw you off course because you're so driven you're going to figure out a way yes. so grant he used to tell me all the time especially when i was working with him uh that you know where there's a lack of creativity there's a lack of commitment because you will figure out the freaking solution if your life depended on it. Then figure it out. That was it, something I used to always hear by him. Yeah, exactly, man. So like for entrepreneurs that make excuses or for people that are starting out to make excuses, like leave that shit at the door, man. Like we don't have time for that. No one has time for that. You shouldn't have time for it. Stop letting that actually hold you back because it's that mindset and your standard being too low that's holding you back from picking up a course or reading a book or hell, watching a free YouTube video. You can start there. That's how I started. Cause I didn't have a bunch of money. I was like scrunching everything together from Postmates and part-time jobs and Ubers and all that in order to actually make that my reality. And I chose that. So love that man. Um, you know, there's a lot of things happening in the digital space. I know you're expanding the university and stuff. So why don't you kind of let them know what you're doing in that space and how you're helping people. Cause I admire what you're doing. And I think a lot of course, creators, entrepreneurs and business owners 
have responsibility and really like from the bottom of my heart, I truly believe that they have one of the biggest impacts that they can make on society because it's easily accessible. There's someone that, you know, you can actually talk to. There's a line of communication opening and uh, it can actually change life and self-education changed my life. So how are you helping people and where can they find you when it comes to diving into what you may be able to offer? So right now, um, you know, our company, uh, about three years ago, we, we, we created the mission for a company because I realized that we were growing so rapidly. And I realized that if, if I, let me go, let me go back a little bit. About four months ago, I did this exercise called, uh, uh, a, uh, death simulation. So I simulated my death. Uh, and the reason being is, remember I told you I had a, we were talking earlier, I had a, uh, what it seemed like was a near death experience yeah. about a year and a half ago. Uh, I had a seizure out of nowhere. And for about four months after that, I, um, I suffered from anxiety, panic attacks, all that stuff, and just couldn't live, you know? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it was because I realized that I can just drop and die like that at any point, although I thought I was living a healthy lifestyle. So my, my coach, my therapist, was like, hey, you know what? I want to do this thing for you. I want to simulate your death. So she, she lays me on the ground. Huh. I um, go through this experience where she tells me a story of my life I'm waking up on a Saturday morning and I feel aches and I go to the doctor and I find that I have this disease and blah, blah, blah. And within six months, I'm technically dying. Before that, she had me write 20 things on a card that I value in life. And as she's reading the story for me, she's like, all right, now drop one card. Now drop one card. So as I'm going through this exercise, I'm letting go of things that I, that I value in life right now, mm. you know? And then I get to the last few cards and those are like my mission, my wife, my mom, my God, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, well, shit, which one do I, you know? And then at the end, all of it is gone. And so what I came to realize is whatever money you make, whatever you have, anything that you make here is all going to go. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The only thing that you'll leave behind is a memory. And when I thought of memory, I'm like, I don't want to just leave a memory of like, like, this is great. This is an incredible memory I will always remember. But it's like, how is this going to make a huge impact on the world? So my mission became, I want to leave a lasting impact. Mm -hmm. And when I think of a lasting impact, I think of someone like Steve Jobs. I think of someone like Walt Disney. I think of someone like the Wright brothers. I feel, I think of someone like, you know, uh, uh, Albert Einstein. When they created things for hundreds of years be beyond them, the thing they created, whether it was a theme park, whether if it was a, you know, an airplane, whatever it was, it will, it has changed society and it will continue to change it. And people hundreds of years later will remember that thing. And so at BJK University, we're on a mission to impact 1 million lives by disrupting the traditional education system because I feel like the education system is rigged against the average man. And it's there to create employees and create workers that are suppressed and not allow the opportunity to live life on their own terms. Mm -hmm. So I want to provide an opportunity for people, an alternative. I'm not saying we don't need, because we need doctors. Yes, we need engineers. Yes, we need lawyers. Yes, we need all that. Mm -hmm. But that's not the only way. Because I was convinced that that was the only way. My mom sold me on that, actually. Because I was actually going to go to school, become a doctor. You know, I graduated oh, yeah. high school with a 3.4 GPA. So I wasn't the troublemaker. I was actually the smart kid. But when I started going and taking classes, I'm like, well, shit, that's not for me. I don't want to do that. You know? Yeah. So it's like, is there another way for me to have a good life? Yeah. And when I learned about these skills online, you know, starting an online business, all that stuff, I'm like, well, shit, there's other people out there that probably want, like, should know about this. And I felt obligated to tell them. But then I also realized that, well, it's not just Amazon. There's like 15 other things that people can do. Mm -hmm. So BJK University is a university that provides people skills. They can turn into income within 90 days or less. Right now, we have one skill, which is Amazon FBA. The goal starting 2025 and beyond is to provide more modern day skills, preferably online. And the future might be also like in-person stuff. Right now it's things you can do online um, that again, you can turn into income within 90 days or less. You don't need to go to school and, and, and you know, tens of years and, you know, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on crap you'll never use. Like I can't remember a thing that I learned in school that I use today outside of English and math, right? It's like, but why did I have to go to school for God knows how long for me to to learn these things. Dude, you know what's crazy, man? They're robbing 
people of their money, but then also their time. Yes. It doesn't take that long. Maybe for a doctor or lawyer, yeah, because there's a lot of sure. bodies of work they have to study. Sure. But for most degrees, business, you can learn more in 90 days through a course and then applying it for six months and learn in that nine month to a year period of time than spending four years studying what? Business fucking admin? Correct. Like, no, <laughs> you're going to learn about administration. That doesn't do anything. That doesn't make any money. So I love what you're up to, man. I think it's really cool. And a lot of entrepreneurs in the space that have made money, that have made multiple seven, even multiple eight figures are in this mode of giving back. And I love it because I think it's our duty to give to uh, give back to people, help inspire the next generation. But then also, like you said, make that lasting impact. So that way that this video content, the stuff that we're actually doing even matters in the world, you know? So uh, where can they find you? We're going to link stuff in the description, but where can they, you know, find you on Instagram or any other place? I mean, you guys can go to Instagram and go to Bashar JK too, but uh, we kind of did a thing uh, where we created like a page where that has like different things for, for people. So if you guys go to bjkpodcast.com, um, there's like a bunch of different, you know, uh, uh, tutorials, free tutorials, just gifts from us to you guys for free that you guys can watch and learn more about what we're doing, what we're up to, and how you guys can get, uh, get involved as well. So Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, well, there you have it, guys. My man, Bashar, giving some great value. If you do like this episode, go ahead and share it with a fellow entrepreneur or someone that's trying to jump into entrepreneurship so they can start adapting modern skill sets so that way they can live the modern way and live in the modern day era. So go ahead and like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next episode. Peace.